Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel, and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. This is part two of the case we're talking about. So if you haven't seen part one yet, it is linked in the description box, and you should watch that first because one always comes before two, at least in the current simulation that we are all living in. In part one, we were introduced to the Tote family. Anthony Tote, his wife, Megan, their three children, Alexander, Tyler, and Zoe, and the family dog, Breezy. We followed Tony and Megan through high school, where they first met and fell in love, to college, where they were considered the it couple on campus, to married life, living in Colchester, Connecticut, running a physical therapy practice, and living as pillars of the community, being seen by all around them as the perfect family who had it all. When Megan became ill, she and Tony decided that it would be best for her and the children to live in Florida full time so that her health could benefit from the warmer climate. And Tony lived half the week in Connecticut and half the week in Florida, flying back and forth, juggling home life and work life. But when Tony got a visit from federal agents because of his insurance fraud activity, he hopped on a plane to Florida and he didn't come back. Instead, he was found several weeks later living in his family's Celebration Florida home with the bodies of Megan, Alexander, Zoe, Tyler, and Breezy. Now that quick summary brings us up to speed, but before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Casetify. Casetify gives your phone protection with personality. Protection is obviously super important because these phones are expensive, right? We have our lives on our phones. We've got contacts, family pictures, important conversations, emails, everything. And Casetify brings you some of the slimmest, most protective phone cases out there. They've upped the innovation on their impact cases by engineering slim bumpers on the corners to make the case drop proof up to 6.6 .6 feet. And they've also upped the innovation on their ultra impact cases by adding four extra corners of Chi Tech shock absorbing protection to make the case drop proof up to 9.8 feet. And both cases are made with 50% recycled material, so you can feel good about your phone case. They also use antimicrobial coating on their cases, which eliminates 99% of bacteria because your phone is notoriously more germy than a toilet seat. So you're protected from more than just drops, but your phone case doesn't have to look protective. It's in your hand and by your side all day, every day. So you should be able to have fun with it and show off a little bit of who you are. And with Casetify, you can choose from tons of designs or you can design your phone case yourself by choosing your favorite color from Casetify Colorways, which is their expanded line of matte, sheer, and clear cases. And then you can add unique touches like monograms, your name, your favorite photos. Some of my favorite Casetify cases have been designed for me by me like this one which is always on my phone because I love it I love the colors I love the moving liquid inside um, sometimes when I'm like deep in thought or I'm just distracted I'll sit here and just like turn my phone around and just stare at it and sort of get lost in thought I also love my yoga skeletons case. I always talk about this case, guys, but I love it. I chose the blue for the case because I liked the juxtaposition of colors. And since falls right around the corner, I will be rocking it until after Halloween. Casetify has tested their phone cases and drops over 6.6 .6 feet, down flights of stairs on the way to work, knocked out of people's hands as a joke. You know, there's always that one guy or gal who thinks that that's funny. And the phone cases, as well as the phones, have always survived, as you can see here during this drop test that I performed in my kitchen. I now feel very confident that I can toss my phone around and not panic about it. I know I've done these drop tests enough. I've dropped my phone in everyday life with a case to buy case on it enough to know that when I pick up my phone, it's not going to be broken. There's enough to be anxious about in this world without stressing out that your phone screen is cracked every time you accidentally drop your phone. If you want to find your new favorite phone case, head over to casetify.com slash Stephanie Harlow so you can get 15% off. That's casetify.com slash Stephanie Harlow, and there's an E on the end of Stephanie 
and Harlow. Thank you so much to Case Five for sponsoring this video, and let's dive right in. Okay, so in part one, we played a portion of the press conference given by Osceola County Sheriff Russ Gibson. You saw Gibson announce what had happened, and you saw him choke up and struggle as he went through the names and birth dates of each member of the Tote family who had been found dead in the home on a reserve place. And Zoe Tote, who was four years of age, born July 23rd, 2015. Of course, we can understand why a human being might show a display of emotion in this situation. Faced with the short amount of time between each child's date of birth and date of death, but Russ Gibson was given some criticism for showing this vulnerability. I personally loved it. I was encouraged and warmed to see it because it's so easy to forget sometimes that these law enforcement officials are people as well, people who go home at night, take off the badge, and tuck their own children into bed. So I do respect Russ Gibson for being so vulnerable, for being so transparent about the fact that this case had really affected him and hit him hard. We should want to see police officers as people who care, who have feelings, and who are an active part of their community. And in my opinion, Russ Gibson showed that. And I'm sure we were all having similar feelings as we were introduced to each of the Tote children in part one of this series. Tony Tote was arrested at his home after the bodies of his family were discovered. Meanwhile, hundreds of miles away, an active police investigation after four people were found dead inside a home in Celebration, Florida, a man taken into custody. Connie McGarren says she has known the family who lives in the home, now wanting to know what happened inside. I know that something tragic had to spark uh, this or trigger it. I can't imagine what, but that that's the feeling that I get. And yes, I want answers. Florida neighbor Marcelo Rodriguez describes the hectic scene outside the home Monday morning. I saw a lot of police with the guns in the hand saying, open the door, open the door. And a few minutes later, I saw the guy on the porch with handcuff. The Osceola County Sheriff's Office says they have a suspect in custody but have yet to release a name. Rodriguez says he took this photo of the man who was bought out of the house by police. And he was brought to the hospital where he told police that he had ingested a lot of Benadryl in order to take his own life. But this may have been a lie or at least an exaggeration. According to an Osceola County Child Fatality Summary Report, Tony was interviewed by detectives at Advent Health Hospital, and his statement is summarized as follows. Anthony last consumed Benadryl on January 11, 2020, and was not under the influence of any drugs or alcohol. Anthony disclosed that himself and his wife Megan had been planning for months to kill their children and then kill each other in a suicide pact. They all had to die together in order to be with each other in the next life. Anthony admitted to killing his three children. Anthony used a knife and stabbed the boys in the abdomen, then suffocated them at one time in separate bedrooms. He could not remember if he stabbed Zoe, but he knew he suffocated her on her bed. Once the children were deceased, Megan used a knife and stabbed herself in the abdomen twice. After a few hours, Megan took grape Tylenol PM, and once she was rested, Anthony suffocated Megan until she died. Anthony waited for all the bodies, who were still in separate rooms, to come out of rigor mortis before moving the bodies. Once the bodies were out of rigor mortis, Anthony moved the bodies to the master bedroom so they could all be together as a family. He placed the boys on mattresses beside his bed so they would be comfortable. He placed his daughter's body wrapped in a sheet at the foot of his bed. Prior to killing Megan, he suffocated the family dog so it could also be with the family in the afterlife. He placed the dog's body in its bed near the boys on the ground. Anthony attempted to take his own life after killing Megan, but failed, claiming he chickened out. Anthony could not remember exactly when he killed his children, but remembered watching college football the following day. The children were killed in the nighttime, and Megan was killed the following day. 
Anthony estimated that these events took place on a Friday and possibly before Christmas 2019, but he could not confirm. He claimed sole responsibility for the deaths of his family and reiterated the premeditated fashion of these murders. He and Megan began planning this suicide pact back in June or July of 2019 in an effort for the entire family to be together in the afterlife. According to the autopsy reports, Megan, Alec, Tyler, and Breezy had all been stabbed. Megan had been stabbed twice in her abdomen. Both wounds were roughly eight inches deep and were believed to have been made anti-mortem or perimortem. Basically, anti-mortem means that she'd been stabbed the first time while she was still alive and the second time when she was very close to death. Alec had a four and a half inch deep stab wound to his left abdomen, and this had resulted to an injury on one of his ribs. Tyler had been stabbed once in the upper abdomen. His wound was three and a half inches deep and had injured his large intestine. Four-year-old Zoe did not show signs of being stabbed. However, it was stated by the medical examiner, Dr. Stephanie, that she very well could have been stabbed. But by the time she was found, Zoe was so badly decomposed, it was difficult to glean anything from her autopsy with great certainty. So basically what the medical examiner is saying here is she may have been stabbed, but she was so decomposed, there's no way to see in her body tissues whether there was trauma there. The results of the autopsy said that all four had died from homicidal violence and diphenhydramine toxicity. Diphenhydramine is an antihistamine and the main ingredient in Benadryl. Taken in recommended doses, it's a very safe substance. It's meant for, you know, allergies. It's an antihistamine. But if too much is taken, the user can experience hallucinations, seizures, delirium, psychosis, cardiac arrest, coma, and even death. In 2020, a new challenge spread through TikTok, so we already know it's going to be stupid. But in this challenge, creators filmed themselves taking up to 10 times the recommended dose of Benadryl. And several of these people, they were teenagers mainly, ended up in the hospital. A few of them even lost their lives. The bodies of Megan and her sons were in a state of early putrefactive decomposition with brown-green discoloration on their bodies, red discoloration on their faces, and skin slippage. They had been left in that bedroom for so long that there wasn't even enough blood available for toxicology testing, so the medical examiner had to use their liver, brain, and chest fluid to test for signs of substances, and this is where they found the Benadryl. There were no substantiated findings of asphyxiation in the autopsies of Alec, Tyler, or Zoe. And this is important because Tony said that he drugged them and stabbed them and then suffocated them. But the autopsies didn't show any substantiated findings of asphyxiation. And based on the level of decomposition, the medical examiner believed that they had all been dead for at least two weeks. It is believed that Tony Tote drugged his family with Benadryl as the forensics team found an empty family-sized bottle and two empty boxes of Benadryl in the garbage at the Reserve Place house. It was actually the Walgreens brand of Benadryl, which I believe is called Wall Drill, but it's exactly the same. You know, these generic brands, they just take like the Benadryl recipe, recipe or formula, formula. They take that and then they just recreate it and put their own stamp on it. Alec Tote had almost 8 milligrams in his system at the time of his death. Alec was the older son, but his younger brother Tyler had been apparently given approximately 320 milligrams of Benadryl prior to his death, so a lot more than Alec. And I'm going to tell you why I believe this is the case in a moment. Once they were sedated, Tony stabbed his family one by one in their respective rooms, but photos of Tony taken after his arrest show several injuries on his body, including a large scratch on his neck. There's marks on his hands. There's also circular sort of hole-like marks on various places of his body. It's believed that when Tony attacked his oldest son, Alec, the boy fought back, scratching and biting his father, who was trying to stab him with a knife. Alec was known as the introverted one, the quiet one, the studious one, the serious one. So when his father attacked him 
and Alec figured out what was happening, he fought back with everything he had in him. The forensic team found two buck hunting knives with five to six inch blades. One was covered in blood in the master bedroom. The mattresses on the floor that Tyler and Alec had been laying on were soaked in blood, as was the mattress on the bed where Megan and Zoe were found. On the nightstand, there were several bottles of a first aid spray with bloody fingerprints on them. There was also black zip ties found all around the room and red nylon restraint straps fastened to the bed. Around the room were various belongings of the family, stuffed animals, a soccer ball, and a sort of shrine at the end of the bed, right by where Zoe had been found. There were teddy bears, there was a little stuffed bunny, little dolls, a cross, a USA soccer scarf, a framed picture of the kids with Elmo at Disney World, a picture of a cat, and a printed poem called Why God Made Little Boys. The poem reads as follows. Before you were born, I prayed for you. I dreamed of you. I imagined you. Now that you're here, I know this. God made little boys to chase fireflies and create mud pies to play with dinosaurs and fly kites way up high. God made little boys for playing tricks and silly pranks, for learning to say yes please and no thanks. God made little boys to chase frogs and catch bugs for swings and sports and quiet hugs. God made little boys, it seems from the start, to leave a smudge upon your heart. Before you were born, I dreamed these joys would come true. For God made little boys so he could give me you. I mean, it's obviously just very devastating to read that poem, knowing it was found by the bodies of Tyler and Alec and Zoe, and wondering why? What's the point? Why would you kill your kids and then print out that poem and leave it near their bodies? So remember Melissa O'Neill from the Department of Health and Human Services? She was one of the agents who was at the Tote family home January 13th to arrest Tony Tote. Well, she spoke to the media about walking into that room. She said, quote, the boys' bodies were as black as leather, end quote. On the nightstand next to the bloody bottles of first aid spray, there was a bunch of papers, uh, receipts, letters, documentation, stuff like that. And amongst all of these papers, there was a December 19th receipt from a nearby sporting goods store called Academy Sports. This was about 17 minutes away from the Totes Celebration Florida home. On this day, Tony Tote had purchased peanut M&Ms. Good choice, way better than regular M&Ms. He also purchased some Gatorade and a Strike Point pellet gun, as well as a packet of air gun ammo. So the reason for this purchase is still unknown. But early on, some people speculated that maybe Tony had bought this pellet gun for, I believe it was $50, because he didn't have enough money for a real gun. However, a loaded gun had also been found in the bedroom of the Toad home. So that couldn't have been the reason. What is interesting, however, are those round wounds that were found on Tony's body, which are pretty accurate matches to the size of that air gun ammo or like a pellet that would be shot from a pellet gun. So maybe Tony Tote bought the pellet gun to use on himself, not his family, because as far as the medical examiner could tell, no gun, not a real one or a pellet gun or a BB gun had been used on Megan, Alec, Tyler, or Zoe or breezy. A Daisy brand BB gun was also found in the home, but police have not revealed any information about any of the guns recovered, such as what they may have been used for, where they were found in the home, like did Tony purchase them, how long had Tony owned them, were any of them shot, etc. We really don't have any of that information. Once again, I expect that a lot of this will come out during the trial and we will definitely be doing an update video to this series when that happens. Because the mystery around this case, the um, the lies, I think, you know, the uh, exaggerations, the misinformation that's coming from Tony Tote specifically. Hopefully when we go to trial and the police and the prosecutors reveal what was found in Tony's phone, such as text messages, voicemails, calls, what he was looking up on the computer, etc., stuff like that, we'll be able to understand a little bit more what happened here. Let's unpack the things found in the bedroom. There were red nylon restraints tied to the bed and black plastic zip ties all over the room. What 
were these used for? Nobody's told us anything. We don't know. But here's my theory. Tony tied Megan to their bed using the red nylon restraints so she couldn't fight back. I believe he probably used the black plastic zip ties on his children for the same reason, which is why many of them were found cut, the zip ties, laying around the master bedroom. He most likely cut the zip ties off when he moved the kids' bodies from their bedrooms to the master bedroom after they were dead. It's likely that Alec, who fought back, He fought back so hard that Tony was unable to get the zip ties on him or he restrained Alec with the zip ties after he had been stabbed and was too weak to fight back and then he left him there to die, tied up with zip ties bleeding out. According to the toxicology report, as we've already talked about, Tyler, the younger son, had much more Benadryl in his system, much more, than Alec did. So maybe Tony had started with Alec, the oldest, and he had given Alec Benadryl first and upped the dose with Tyler once Tony realized that Alec was still with it enough and conscious enough to fight back. This is just my theory. This is just my speculation. Once again, this has not been proven anywhere. There is no evidence. Well, I mean, there's some evidence. Like, I'm looking at the evidence and and saying what it says to me, but this has not been confirmed by the police or anybody. Let me know what you think in the comments about that theory. Each of the family members had some sort of sentimental item on their person or in their hands, including Tony, except for Zoe. Tyler and Alec were holding rosaries. Megan was wearing Tony's wedding ring. Tony had on a a cross necklace, like a chain with a cross on it. And he also had his grandfather's ring that he was wearing around that chain. But Zoe didn't have anything. And this will make more sense when we talk about a jailhouse phone call from Tony to his sister Chrissy that was made on February 27th, 2020. So during this call, Tony told his sister Chrissy, quote, I'm in an isolation type cell wearing a vest only for at least six weeks. They've been telling me. I don't remember anything pretty much over Christmas and the first week I got here. I don't remember coming here. I don't remember anything after the events that happened, that kind of stuff. I have no idea where I was, where I am. And the only thing I remember is being at the hospital, I guess, I assume before I got here. And I remember waking up here and seeing one of the officers that I've become pretty close with. Other than that, I have no idea of anything, end quote. Okay, so remember, Tony gave a full confession at the hospital on January 13th. We read the confession he gave. But by the end of February, he suddenly had memory loss of that time period, and he didn't remember giving that confession at all, and he didn't remember anything over Christmas until he woke up in prison. Now, he's not going to shift the blame to his wife just yet, but he does start building that narrative in this phone call with his sister. Tony speaks to Chrissy very cryptically at times, saying things such as, quote, I want you to know a couple of things that I absolutely loved, honored, and obeyed Megan through everything because a lot of things will come out. I can't talk about it right now. Realize that, okay? End quote. So in my opinion, this is him building the narrative. He's like, I loved, honored, and obeyed Megan through everything because a lot of things are going to come out, Chrissy. Can't talk about it right now, but I want you to realize that. Like, I want you to know. I loved, honored, and obeyed her through everything. He's saying, basically, in my opinion, this was her idea. And because I am such a great husband who supports her in everything, love, honor, obey, took my vows very seriously. When this is what she wanted to do, I had to support her in this as well. That's what he's saying, in my opinion. That's just my opinion. You don't come for me, Tony. Tony told Chrissy that he didn't even remember flying from Connecticut to Florida after he talked to the FBI, yet he was able to go on and describe in very specific detail the events of the night that his entire family was killed, including the new revelation that, hey, he wasn't even home when it happened. So he remembered what he was doing, but he couldn't really tell Chrissy what like Megan and the kids were doing because he wasn't even there. He said that the night it happened, Megan had begged him to go to their condo. Remember, they have a condo in Celebration, Florida as well. It's just a few blocks away because she wanted him to get a silver Mickey Mouse necklace. This was apparently a very important piece of jewelry to four-year-old Zoe, and she'd been asking for it constantly. Tony told his sister Chrissy that Zoe really wanted that necklace for reasons that Chrissy would have to find out later, and Megan told him it was in the master bedroom of the condo in a jewelry box. Tony also said, quote, it was the last thing we needed, end quote. So we just talked about how Megan, Alec, and Tyler 
were all found with sentimental belongings. And Tony himself was wearing a sentimental piece of jewelry as well, but not Zoe. Was the Mickey Mouse necklace the last thing they needed? Because Zoe would also need to have something of sentimental value to hold on to as she traveled into the afterlife to join her family. I think that's certainly what he was saying without coming right out and saying it, telling Chrissy, you'll find out this stuff later. I'm not supposed to be talking about it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Tony said he went over to the condo, but he couldn't find the key to the condo. So he spent two hours at the condo looking for the key before returning to the reserve place home to get a crowbar out of the garage, and this was around 7.30 or 7.45 in the evening. He then went back to the condo, got the door opened with the crowbar, and went inside. Tony told Chrissy, quote, But I couldn't find the Mickey thing, so if you could find that. But I couldn't find it in the jewelry box. I ended up falling asleep, and let's just leave it at that. End quote. At this point... Tony Tote began to softly cry, and he begged Chrissy to go to the condo and find the necklace. He also mentioned that he'd been wearing his uh, grandfather's ring around a necklace that held his cross, and he'd been wearing it when he'd been arrested, and he really wanted to make sure that Chrissy got it back for him and figured out where it was. He didn't have his own wedding ring on because Megan had been wearing it since he said the babysitter had stolen hers a few years back. And then he says, like, oh, he reminds me so much of so many um, different criminals and murderers and just all around shitty people that we've talked about in the past. He does a lot of talking about how great he is, how much he cares, how much he loved, how much he did. So he says, you know, Megan was wearing my wedding ring because hers had been stolen by the babysitter a few years ago. And then he follows that up and he says, well, you know, it was never proven, but we think that's what happened. It's just so stupid, irrelevant. Why? Why did you even have to say that? Why do I get the feeling that the babysitter definitely didn't steal that ring? And I wonder what happened to Megan's wedding ring. Tony also said that when he left the condo the next morning after waking up and sleeping all night, he'd left the door to the condo open so that Chrissy or someone else could come down to Florida at a later time and take care of everything, which sounds a lot like Tony knowing there was a chance he might not be returning to that condo, whether it was because he was dead in some alleged suicide pact or because he would be in prison for the murders of his family or because he planned on running, running away, getting out of there. He told Chrissy that his rare baseball cards could be found in a Tupperware container in the backseat of his car and that his car was in pretty good condition. It might just need like new tires and whatever. But what's interesting about the baseball cards being in the car, and I actually had listened to the um, Looking for the Tote Family podcast. Uh, It's very good. Some of it can get a little repetitive, uh, which I don't like, but it was very good, good information. But I already kind of thought about this when I heard the the call between Tony and Chrissy, and then the podcast kind of reaffirmed that they were feeling the same way. Why were Tony's rare baseball cards in his car? Who stores rare baseball cards that are worth a lot of money in their car in a Tupperware container? Was he planning on leaving and using these baseball cards as like money because he wouldn't be able to use credit cards or things like that because he'd be a fugitive. He'd be looked for. So maybe he was planning to take the rare baseball cards and sort of sell them or pawn them on his way through wherever he was going in order to have money to travel with and hide out with. Chrissy and Tony talked again on March 3rd while Chrissy was in Florida cleaning up Tony's shit, or so she told him. I like that she called him on that because she does seem, I mean, she's a sister, I get it. She seems to feel really sorry for him at at many points in these conversations. You know, she asks how he's doing, things like that, but she doesn't hesitate to, like, give him shit when he needs shit. And she's saying to him, like, yeah, I'm here in Florida because he asked her, you know, what are you up to? And she's like, oh, I'm just here in Florida cleaning up your mess trying to fix everything that you broke, Chrissy told Tony that she'd found Zoe's necklace. And he was like, oh my God, that's great. Thank you so much. Where did you find it? And she responded that it was at the condo in the jewelry box, exactly where Megan had said it would be, exactly where Tony had told Chrissy Megan had said it would be. But apparently Tony had been unable to find it that night. He had searched through the jewelry box. He'd looked through the condo. He couldn't find it. And then the effort of searching for this Mickey Mouse necklace, it was so um, taxing. He was so exhausted that he just had to lay down and fall asleep until the next morning, at which point he claims that he went home and found his family dead. 
Tony then proceeded to complain about his dead wife, Megan. He said she was controlling, and even though she was aware of their financial struggles and she was struggling with health issues, as was Tony because he'd gained weight and he'd been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they were just a mess, money problems, they're sick, he said that Megan would not let him tell any of their family or friends about the problems they were going through because she wanted to keep it a secret. And she had forbidden him from going to the doctors to get help for his health problems. Tony told Chrissy that one day in August of 2019, he and Zoe had been alone in the house watching a movie and he'd passed out because he's sick. When Megan returned home to find him passed out and she woke him up, he begged her, he begged her to let him go to the doctor. But she was like, no which frankly doesn't make much sense to me because he was living in a different state for half the week. So if he really wanted to see a doctor, how would Megan prevent him from doing that when she was over 1,000 miles away physically? Like there was over 1,000 miles physically between them when he was in Connecticut and she was in Florida. Tony also said that Megan had forced him to move away from their family and friends and he apologized to Chrissy. He was like, I'm so sorry I left you guys. I never wanted to. I had no say in the decision. It was all Megan. Megan wanted us away from everyone because she wanted to keep all of our secrets and problems a secret. According to Tony, Megan had made previous attempts to do this. Um, he's insinuating that Megan's made previous attempts to take the lives of her children and her own life, which is why he had chosen to stay in Florida after Christmas instead of returning to his practice and the waiting federal investigation. Yeah, it was definitely the fact that Megan was like unstable that you decided to stay in Florida, not because you didn't want to go back and talk to the FBI. Chrissy asked Tony if he remembered talking to her in December because he'd apparently been kind of an asshole. That's what she said. And Tony claimed he didn't remember talking to anyone in December. Um, now, this is interesting because we never really find out exactly what Tony said to Chrissy in December. All of the news reports say that the last time Tony texted Chrissy, I forget the exact day now because I don't have it in front of me, but it was just a couple of days before she called for the wellness check. So these reports say that this was the last time Tony talked to his sister, but whereas other conversations between Tony and Chrissy have been talked about and we know what was said. We never know what was said during these last text exchanges and it seems that it was pretty bad, but we don't know exactly what was said. She's never told anybody. She didn't say it on the phone when she called 911 and um, she doesn't get specific here with Tony. So I'm very interested to know once the trial happens, what exactly Tony was saying in these very, um, stressful times for him because he would have been sending those texts to Chrissy, the last text he sent after Megan and the kids were dead. So what was he saying exactly? What was his state of mind like? What was he saying? So then Tony tells his sister, you know, a lot of people are like contacting me and visiting me in here and calling me in here about writing a book. So I'm going to start like outlining stuff and, and working on this book to which Chrissy responded like, that's probably a bad idea, dude. You know, it's not a good look. Just two months after losing his entire family, Tony starts writing a book about it from prison, which he intends to profit from. <laughs> is he for real? Like, is this real life? Chrissy told Tony that she and the rest of, you know, his family were working through everything that happened together with Megan's family because they were all still very close. They all considered each other to be family and they all wanted to help each other at all costs because everybody had lost Megan and the boys and Zoe. And of course they all wanted to make sense of what exactly had happened, but it was still continuing to be a battle every day and everyone was suffering because of what Tony had done. So in these calls, Tony does not come right out and say, Megan killed our children and then she killed herself, but he certainly implies it enough times. And this is a throwback from the Watts case which at the time of Tony Tote's arrest had just recently happened in the summer of 2018. Chris Watts took the lives of his pregnant wife and his two daughters, and then he told the police that his wife had killed his girls, and then he had killed her in a blind rage. Now, it's not exactly the same scenario, right? But it's obviously the same kind of situation. It's a diffusion of responsibility. It's a distribution of blame. And later, in a 27-page letter to his father, Tony Tote would make more allegations against his wife, who was no longer alive to dispute the things he claimed or to set the record straight. While we're on the subject of Tony's father, Robert Tote, 
there's something we need to talk about. When Tony Tote was accused of killing his family, it seemed as if history may have been repeating itself because when he was just four years old, Tony's father had been charged and convicted for paying someone to kill his wife, Tony's mother. Robert Tote was 28 years old in 1980. He was a board certified special education teacher who worked at Ben Salem High School in Pennsylvania, and he lived in Levittown, Pennsylvania with his 27 year old wife, Loretta, and their two children, Anthony and Chrissy. The incident happened on March 19, 1980. Loretta wasn't feeling well that evening, and she knew that her husband was going to be home late because he was taking night classes at Trenton State College, working towards his master's degree. Or at least that's what he told her he was doing. So after she tucked her two kids into bed, Loretta put on her nightgown and got into bed herself. Loretta's memories of what happened next are patchy at best, and you'll find out why soon. But she claims she woke up to find two men in her room. One was in bed with her, holding her down, hitting her in the face, and she described him as a white man with kinky hair. Loretta said, quote, The guy in the bed was holding my nightgown and hitting me. I remember hearing a bump, 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 and my head going back, end quote. Loretta claims that her memory is dim after that, but at some point she remembered getting out of bed with a terrible headache. She said, quote, My head felt really weird. I remember walking by my dresser, and I remember turning around and seeing blood all over the bed. I walked into the bathroom and turned the light on, and I saw my face and all the blood. My eye looked just horrible, end quote. Loretta wasn't aware of it at that moment, but she had been shot in the face. The bullet had gone through her left eye and lodged itself in her brain. She then went downstairs and saw that her car was gone, so she called a neighbor, who called the police, and they arrived at 11.43 p.m. At almost exactly the same time, Robert Tote arrived back home from his night classes. Loretta was taken to the hospital, where it took hours for the doctors to figure out that she'd actually been shot because initially they thought she had just been beaten. Loretta would end up losing the vision in her eye and fragments of the bullet would remain in her head, but she survived. But this is obviously why she had a hard time putting together the events of that night in her memory. I'm going to read you a portion of a September 1981 Philadelphia Inquirer article that says, quote, Ben Salem police began what would be a four-month investigation into the apparent attempted murder, burglary, and auto theft. Evidence collected included the five guns Tote owned, bloody pillowcases, bullet fragments in the nightstand, and outside the home, a bottle of blackberry brandy, three-quarters drained, that was found on top of a woodpile next to some vomit. Robert Tote was among the first to be interviewed by police. He told them that he was at night school at the time of the assault. Among those he named when asked if anyone had recently visited the house was John Chermonte, 19. For Ben Salem police, the pieces were falling, but not into place. The day after the shooting, police found Mrs. Tote's car in a parking lot off Route 13, south of Street Road in Ben Salem. Detective Kenneth Hopkins, who headed the investigation, made note in one of dozens of reports he filed that both doors were unlocked and the passenger door was ajar, which, to this writer, meant there were two people. The next day, two days after the shooting, Hopkins interviewed the Totes' son, Anthony, then four. The boy said he woke up hearing his mother screaming. When he walked into the hallway, a black man with a T carved on his forehead picked the boy up and put him back into bed. Anthony told police he saw another man he said was wrestling with mommy on her bed, according to a police report. In the days that followed, two things happened that would narrow the focus of the police investigation. Fingerprints on the brandy bottle were determined to be those of John Tremonti, and Tote's alibi that he'd been attending night school in Trenton was found to be a lie, end quote. So John Tremonti was a 20-year-old with a police record for some small-time crimes. He was also a known drug addict. Um, he had not been a student of Robert Tote's, but his brother, his younger brother, was. Apparently, John Charmante had been to the home of the Totes in March of 1980 when Robert had helped him look for a job and update his resume, and Robert Tote was not taking night classes. He was living a legitimate double life with a young registered nurse from the town over named Colleen Fecko. Colleen would testify at Robert's trial and say that she and Robert were engaged to be married. They'd even set a date for their wedding, April 19, 1980 a month after someone broke into his home and tried to kill his current wife. 
Photos were shown to the jury of Robert and Colleen cutting a cake at their engagement party, and a priest testified that he'd spoken to the couple about choosing a church to be married in and having him, like, marry them. So everybody, like, in Colleen's congregation at her church and, like, in her town, they thought that Robert Tote was just, like, the best thing to ever happen to Colleen and this nice, smart young man who drove a nice car, planning to marry Colleen, and they were going to have a great life. They had no idea that he was living with, like, another woman and, and two children just a town over. Colleen and her family testified that Robert Tote had been with them on the night of the attempted murder of Loretta, and he hadn't left until about 11.30 p.m. John Chermonte gave three different versions of what had happened that night. Initially, he denied having anything to do with it. He claimed he'd only been at the Toad House one time, and that was when he was filling out applications with Robert. Three months later, however, Chermonte had a different story. This time, he claimed that Robert had paid him $800 to come to his house that night and ransack it, making it look like a home invasion, while Robert was upstairs killing the babysitter. Charmante said that he'd been downstairs, like, messing everything up, doing what he was supposed to be doing, drinking blackberry brandy, when he heard a pop sound come from upstairs. That sounded like uh, firecrackers. And at this point, he ran out of the house, and he went to the woodpile where he proceeded to vomit. In yet another statement to the police, John Charmante claimed he'd been paid by Robert Tote to kill his wife, but Charmante had acted alone. Tote wasn't there. He'd stood at the foot of Loretta's bed and fired what he thought was one shot before he went downstairs, ransacked the downstairs area, then he stole Loretta's car, and he got the hell out of there. He said he threw the gun into Nashamini Creek, and this would be the account that would be used in court. Once again, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, Charmonti's account of firing the shots also didn't jibe with the bullet marks left on two pieces of bedroom furniture, according to tests made by Walter Zidanowski, a state police officer turned private detective who was hired by the Totes. Two shots were fired, the second of which was determined to have entered Mrs. Totes' eye and lodged into her brain. If the first bullet, which Charmonte said he never heard discharge, had been fired from the foot of the bed, as Charmonte contended, it would not have left marks on two pieces of furniture unless it had ricocheted off the headboard at a 90-degree angle, which the detective said was highly unlikely. His testimony on the ballistics, though, was not allowed in court because his credentials had not been established. The Tote's son, who had told the police he'd seen two men, also did not testify. There was more testimony, some damaging, some inconsistent. Chermonti's friend, Edward DePizzo, told the jury that Chermonti had shown him a gun and some cartridges after getting out of Tote's car about a week before the shooting. DePizzo said Charmante told him, that's the guy Tote who wants me to bump off his old lady. But that admission, as Tote's lawyers pointed out, came two weeks before Charmante knew who the target of the murder attempt was, according to his own testimony. The gun was never found. Tote argues that Neshamini Creek, which winds through Laura Bucks County and spills into the Delaware River, doesn't have a strong enough current to move an item of that weight downstream. That if Charmante had indeed thrown it into the creek, the subsequent searches by the state police divers would have turned it up. During one day of the creek search, police looked up on a nearby bluff and saw a man watching them. It was Robert Tote. He said he was on a fishing trip with his son. This story, which came out in trial testimony, was another case of Tote appearing guilty, much like his response, also repeated in court, when police told him he was being arrested for the attempted murder of his wife. So what, he'd said, end quote. So this was really actually an excellent article. Um, having been written in 1981, I found it on newspapers.com or newspaper.com. Newspapers.com, that sounds right and better. It was really good. It was very in-depth. Um, what it's basically saying is Robert Tote was arrested for trying to kill his wife or for paying someone to kill his wife because he was having an affair and so he wanted to kill his current wife so that he could marry his new wife because their wedding date was like a month away, right? So he pays John Charmante, who apparently is kind of known around town for being a troublemaker, but also for being a drug addict and also being sort of um, mentally challenged. Like he wasn't the brightest bulb. He was very malleable and um, sort of naive. But after being arrested, Tony Tote and like his entire family, including his wife, they said he didn't do this. He's being set up 
and John Charmante is lying, basically. Like, why would you believe this drug addict, this guy whose stories changed so many times? Plus, you have the the people who were there at the house that night, both four-year-old Anthony Tote, Tony Tote, and his mother, who witnessed two men, a white man and a black man, who were in the house, who were participating in this crime that day. So basically, the article mentions that the car was found uh, the next day, and it looked as if two people had been occupying the car. Tony and his mother saw two people there that night. At first, uh, John Charmonti had said that he'd worked with Tony, and then he said, no, he acted alone. So there was a lot of inconsistencies, and Tony Toad is basically saying, I didn't pay him to do this. He did this of his own free will, and he brought somebody with him who's never even been identified or talked about. The Chief Deputy District Attorney Alan Rubenstein claimed that John Chermonti's testimony was a major factor in Robert Tote's conviction, but Robert himself was the second most effective witness. Rubenstein said, quote, the guy very, very much convicted himself, end quote. During trial, Rubenstein brought out another witness, a high school girl who had claimed to have also been intimate with Robert Tote. Tote and his lawyers were not happy with the prosecutor Rubenstein bringing up his affairs and like his other girlfriends and stuff. They said it was um, inflammatory and unnecessary, but Rubenstein felt it was necessary to show Robert's motive and to show that he was no Danny Osmond, like he wasn't this great guy. The image he projected to the world, that was the impression that everyone had of Robert Tote. He was young, handsome, smart, helpful, a pillar of the community. He was a respected teacher and a beloved wrestling coach. He had a beautiful $90,000 home, which in uh, today's day would be like, I think, probably a $500,000, $600,000 home. He drove a nice car. He had a beautiful wife, two adorable, well-behaved children. Rubenstein believes that this is why it was so easy for Robert to manipulate John Charmante, who had a learning disability. Charmante looked up to Robert. He admired who he was, the reputation he'd made for himself, and the life that he had built. Now, to this day, Robert Tote, who has since been released from prison, denies he had anything to do with the plot to kill his wife. He's always denied it um, during trial, after trial, after he got out of prison. He claims that John Charmante thought that he had drugs in his house because Robert seemed to have a lot of money. Like, he didn't have a mortgage. Everything was paid off. He had nice things. So John Charmonti went into the house to rob it, thinking that the only reason that Robert would have this much money was because he was like selling drugs. And then John Charmonti ended up shooting Loretta. Now, Robert never really gives like a reason for that. Maybe he was startled by her. Maybe it was a robbery gone wrong, whatever. But Robert says that John Charmonti wasn't even someone you would trust to walk your dog. Charmonti would go on to testify against Robert in exchange for a lower sentence. And the entire time Loretta Tote stood by her husband, testifying that she did not believe her husband had anything to do with her attempted murder, saying, quote, I'm not sticking up for him because he's my husband. I'm sticking up for him because he didn't do it, end quote. However, three months after Robert was sentenced, she filed for divorce. And when he was out on bail after his arrest, she stayed in Pennsylvania with the kids, while Robert moved to Norfolk, Virginia and began living with Colleen, the woman that he was planning to marry. Robert said that after the shooting, his four-year-old son, Tony, developed a lot of emotional issues. Of course, if what Tony told the police was true, if he heard his mother screaming, if he saw a man on her bed like wrestling with her, and if he was basically put back into bed by some intruder, that's very terrifying. Little Tony was restless. He couldn't sleep alone. He had to switch rooms with his sister, and he became very quiet and introverted. It seemed that young Tony, without having the ability to process the traumatic event that he had witnessed, he'd started suppressing his emotions. It's become an interest of mine in the past few months studying childhood trauma and the impact on the adult of the personality from said childhood trauma. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was a psych major in college. It's always been something that's interested me, but... This is very interesting, and I think it's so underplayed. It's not talked about enough. The huge impact that childhood trauma will have on the personality of an adult. What's scary is a lot of the times these adults have suppressed this childhood trauma because they were children when it happened and they couldn't handle it. They couldn't deal with it, so they hid it. They put it in a little box and locked it up, so it's still affecting them but they don't know what it is or why. They don't even know that they're really being affected. They just think this is the way I am. And if more people took the time to actually 
dig really deep and figure out what it was in their childhood that's causing them to act out in a certain way or behave in a certain way. And they started seeing a mental health professional to try to get to the bottom of it. I think the world would be a better place. And it is scary as a parent knowing that, like, you're responsible for these little people who are going to grow up to be adults. And you want to make sure that you avoid, you know, exposing them to any trauma because you don't want it to affect negatively their life in the future. Like, it's a, it's a lot of pressure, okay? Being a parent is the most important job in the world because you're, like, building the next generation. You're, like, creating the people who are going to go out in the world and either make it a better place or a worse place. <laughs> a lot of pressure, man. <sighs> I get it. I get it. I, I need a minute. Okay, so Loretta filed for divorce three months after her husband was um, sent to prison. But she still kind of was, like, on his side for a while. But she would go on to remarry another man, a Navy man named Irvin Schmidt. This is actually the man who would go on to be the person that Tony and Chrissy called dad. And together, they moved to Montville, Connecticut, where Tony would go on to flourish, where he would go on to excel at everything he tried, where he would go on to be amazing at academics and amazing in sports. The guy we heard about in part one, the guy who was on the student council, and the guy who was the RA that anybody could feel comfortable talking to. After the move from Pennsylvania to Connecticut, Loretta had a change of heart, and she told reporters, I believe it was in 1984, that her opinion on her ex-husband had changed. She said, quote, being away from here and then reading the newspaper articles about it and thinking about it, there were just too many lies, end quote. Rubenstein, who was the prosecutor on Robert's trial, he believed that Robert was so arrogant, he actually thought he was going to get away with it. And Rubenstein said, quote, when the verdict came in, the calmest person in the courtroom was Robert Tote. Not that he expected it, because he didn't expect it. But it's just a coldness, and it's almost difficult to comprehend. But the evidence against him, in the end, albeit circumstantial, was compelling. And the jury, God bless them, saw right through it. End quote. Robert Tote had been sure that he was so charismatic that he could take the witness stand and convince anyone of anything that he wanted. And in this case, he wanted to convince the jury that he'd been framed by an overly ambitious prosecutor and a degenerate drug dealer. But Robert Tote actually made a horrible witness. He was cocky. He was arrogant. He was cold and emotionless. And the jury just, they didn't like him. Since then, Robert Tote has been vocal about his distaste for reporters who compared his case to his son's case and wondered if Robert had somehow passed down like a psychopath gene to Tony. However... Robert did tell the Looking for the Tote Family podcast that he believed if Tony had not gone through that childhood trauma, Megan and her kids would still be alive. And he knows that both of his children had to go through hell after he went to prison. So this is an important statement. Robert Tote, Tony's father, is saying if Tony hadn't seen and witnessed his mother's attempted murder when he was four, I think that Megan and her kids would still be alive today. That's saying something. Robert Tote was sentenced to 10 to 20 years in prison, but in 1984, the Bucks County Common Pleas Court cut that to 5 to 10 years, claiming the original sentence had been too harsh. Tony Tote had undergone years of therapy, and neither he or his sister Chrissy had anything to do with their father after Robert Tote went to prison or after he was released from prison until 2010 when Tony, without his sister's knowledge, began communicating with Robert Tote via Facebook. On December 28, 2010, Robert sent Tony messages on Facebook, and then they sent messages back and forth for three to four days, during which Robert expressed his desire to speak to his son on the phone, which happened a few days after that. At the beginning of March 2010, Robert and his wife traveled to Connecticut, and for the first time in decades, and for the first time in decades, he was able to see his son and daughter in person and meet their spouses and children. When Robert walked into Tony's house, he felt proud of the lovely life his son had built for himself, and he felt proud of his beautiful grandchildren. At this point, it was just Tyler and uh, Alec, and Robert had never met them before. Robert said, quote, I walked into the kitchen, and the two of them were running around the house like banshees. We stayed there for three or four hours. I told Danielle, let's not overstay our limit. This is a traumatic time for the kids and the grandkids and everyone else. Alec came over and gave me a kiss and said goodbye. Um, I'm crying my eyes out. Went to the car and drove home. Two days later, my sister Gloria died of lupus, end quote. So both Tony and Chrissy attended their Aunt Gloria's funeral, even though they didn't really have any relationship with Robert's side of the family. And at this point at the funeral, they were able to meet their father's side of the family, who were apparently a big, loud Italian bunch. 
Maybe that was why Tony and Chrissy seemed withdrawn at the funeral. Robert said, quote, For some reason, you could tell that they almost wanted to go into a shell. I couldn't explain it. We went to lunch with the family. I walked them outside and said goodbye, kissed my daughter, kissed my son, and they got in the car and drove away, end quote. Now in the next video, the last part of this case, we're going to read a letter from Tony to Robert. We've mentioned it before. And we're going to read that. And... Tony says something in this letter that indicates why he and Chrissy were acting as if they were in shells. So the next day, Tony emailed Robert. The email said that Robert needed to leave Tony alone for a while. He couldn't tell him exactly why, but Tony just couldn't do it anymore at this time. Chrissy told Robert that Tony was having nightmares again, and he hated Robert again for leaving them. So apparently having Robert come back into his life was bringing this old trauma back up. And for the next 10 years, there was very minimal contact between Robert and his children until January 12th of 2020, when Chrissy texted her father asking if he'd seen or heard from Tony. Robert didn't know what had happened with Tony and to his family until several days afterwards, when he was informed that his son had killed his wife and three children. Robert would go on to rebuild his relationship with Tony while his son was in prison. He would talk to him at least three times a week, and this is going to become important, once again, when we examine that letter that Tony sent his father in prison, which we'll do in the next and final part of the series. Tony Tote was charged with four counts of first-degree premeditated murder, but the charges were reduced to second-degree murder, and Tony entered a written, not guilty, plea. He was denied bail and assigned a public defender since he didn't have the money to pay for his own attorney. When he had left the hospital to be transferred to jail, this happened. Allegedly confessed to killing your family. Can you tell us why? Tony, they say you confessed to killing your family. Can you tell us why? The family that you killed. Tony, the community needs People. answers. How long were they there? How long were they in the house with you? Why? It's your last chance. I think we can all agree, Tony certainly looks out of it, right? He isn't responding to the questions. His eyes are glazed over. He looks like someone who's gone through an ordeal. But what kind of ordeal? That's the real question. Is this an ordeal of him walking into his house and stumbling upon the horrific sight of everyone he loved dead? That would cause some sort of disassociation, some sort of break from reality. I understand that. But I have to feel like he might also be out of it in this way if he'd just stepped into the real world for the first time after not only murdering every single person in his family and their dog, but then proceeding to live with their corpses for half a month. So why does he look like this? Why does he look so out of it? Why does he look so disconnected? Why does he look as if he is hiding in a little room in his brain? He's not answering the reporter's questions that they're screaming at him, which I don't blame him, honestly. I'm not defending him, but they're obnoxious. <laughs> One of the reporters is like, what about the dog? But on that note, what about the dog? Tony never talks about Breezy, never. Not in his calls to his family, not in his letters to his father. He never says like, oh, you know, my kids and Breezy, or I feel so bad about what happened to Breezy. Like he does not mention the dog. But anyways, a little food for thought. Let's go over the similarities between Anthony and Tony Tote. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. More parallels will present themselves as we continue on. We have two men who on the outside appear to be respectable members of their community, great family men, great providers, but just under the surface, something a bit more nefarious was bubbling up, waiting to spill over. Now, Robert Tote claims he is innocent of trying to kill his wife. And who am I to say that he's not? I've read his appeal paperwork, and I agree. There are many details in that 1980 case that don't necessarily fit together at all, at least not perfectly. It's like when you're doing a puzzle and you're sure you have the right piece 
and it sort of fits, you know, but it's not flush with the other pieces around it. And no matter which way you turn it or how hard you like slam it in there, it's still a bit off. The appeal paperwork highlights a lot of areas where Robert didn't necessarily get a fair trial, and that is why his sentence was reduced. However, Robert was convicted by a jury and he served his time, so the answer of whether or not he actually paid a 20-year-old man to kill the mother of his children so he could marry another woman, that's probably an answer only Robert will have. Whether he's being honest about it or not, in his head, in his heart, he knows what actually happened. Tony was only four when this happened, so he didn't even grow up with his father's influence, but the events of March 19, 1980 may have truly been so traumatic for Tony that it forever changed him. And it's pretty obvious that Tony spent the majority of his life believing that his father had tried to kill his mother since he cut off all contact. And I think Tony spent the majority of his life trying to be the perfect husband and the perfect father because his own father hadn't been. And both men, Tony and Robert, would go on to be caught in very compromising positions with a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that they had done something wrong. But they would also both go on to deny having anything to do with what happened. If Tony had not been responsible for the deaths of his family, why did he live in the same house as their bodies for weeks? Why didn't he call the police or a neighbor for help if his hands were clean, if he was innocent, if he was you know, manipulated into doing this by his wife. Why did he tell the police one thing and his sister Chrissy another, and then his father, in this letter, completely another thing? These questions will be answered next time as we go through a long and extensive letter that Tony sent Robert, where he goes over the events of that night again, and once again, kind of like John Tremonte, his story changed. Thank you so much for being here with me. Don't forget to check out Casetify. Link is in the description box. Don't forget to hit the like button if you liked this. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't. Or if you have subscribed, just make sure you still are subscribed because YouTube likes to unsubscribe people from my channel all the time. But whatever, that's okay. I forgive them. I'm in a forgiving mood today at least. And don't forget to share this video if you think it's worth sharing. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Links are in the description box. And in the description box, you can also find the link to my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week. That's why it's called Crime Weekly. With retired police detective Derek Levasseur, we go over a new true crime case. We have multi-parters. It's awesome. Our new episodes go up on audio platforms every Friday. And we have a YouTube channel as well, where that same case will be put up on YouTube the following Wednesday. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much to my Patreons. I'm talking to you directly right now. I'm working so hard on uh, making Patreon better and adding so much more value. And I have so many plans um, in the works. It's going to be great. So thank you so much to my Patreons who are um, infinitely patient with me. I will see everybody very soon. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Stay safe. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voice is getting too loud Oh, this feeling's out of baby It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say a Hail Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I got blood, blood on